Research Center of the Ministry of Justice, and I do research in this area. At the same time, I'm also a lecturer of cybersecurity and privacy at Oxford Rotterdam. So two days I work for, I work for here, and then three days there. Um, so please, if you have any question, ask question. I have too many slides. Maybe some of the some parts I am going to pass because if there is enough knowledge in that area, I go fast. Otherwise, I go slowly, and then at the end, I will then, uh, in order to keep it in one hour before time, to finish at time, then uh, I will uh, maybe the last part I will not uh, discuss today, but you can have a slide later. I teach this course uh, at the CME. I don't know. If you know that. Uh, and uh, these are the topics landscape of privacy enhancing technology. I am technical background. I try to link technical aspect of privacy protection with the non-technical and especially judicial parts. And today I'm going to discuss with you the first two parts and give an overview of the foundation's privacy and also how to protect data when you publish data. And hopefully I'm also linked to the big data, the, the topic that you are studying right now in this course. And also I'll do privacy by design principles at the end So this is a ten topic area that I'm going one by one. And I don't know how you have done anything, any course on privacy in general? No. Or ethics? Ethics, yeah. Ethics. So the first part is about that part, is the privacy in general. And then uh, the other one, specific aspect of privacy protection techniques and in the context of big data. So in this, this specific topic, I focus only on data minimization. The thing that aspect that less, atten uh, less attention is paid on uh, in protecting data. Motivation. Many people say that, uh, you know, said that uh, privacy is gone, is not needed, is dead. You know, anybody agrees with that? No, unfortunately. Because uh, if you consider pri privacy as a secrecy, yeah, maybe it is, it is true. We don't have any more that so much secret information that we only keep to ourselves. But the point, if you consider how you govern the, the way that, the, that your data is processed, it is alive. And for that, you can see, for example, Edward Snowden, uh, what happened in 2013. And we had a safe harbor decision by the European Court of Justice that overruled the, the, the decision that the American companies can get our data, European data, uh, and then they can do what they, the way that they like. They can define what the, how they are to deal with the, our privacy, and then uh, they can accordingly do that, um, but it is not, not anymore acceptable. And also GDPR, which is in effect in 2000 uh, from this year. And uh, protection privacy is necessary for privacy officers, of course, by definition, and for data consumers, because when you get the data, it is manipulated. Then you have to know how it is manipulated for protecting privacy in order to have good data anal analytics. <coughs> if you don't know these techniques, how they are, they are manipulated, then maybe you conclude wrong, uh, wrong conclude, you come to wrong conclusions, and you, make, uh, you may come up with uh, wrong advice. And also, if you are a data controller, the, your job, or data analyst and data processor, your job is to protect data of uh, the privacy sensitive data of people. If you don't do that, that is illegal now. Then different, uh, send different uh, punishments can, can you expect for yourself. So it is necessary now to consider this data protection when you're dealing with privacy, privacy uh, private uh, person data of people. And my job, as I said, is that to bridge the gap between technical aspects and non-technical aspects. And particularly, I focus on data analytics and data engineering part, and linking with two legal aspects. But ethical aspects, you can think of psychological aspects and administrative aspects, you can also think of them, are relevant. But my focus is more on legal aspects. So, 
This was the first part of motivation why privacy protection is needed. Any questions? <coughs> and privacy definitions. Can someone define privacy? For me? Is there any? Yeah? Information that you uh, want to keep for yourself and personal information that you want to spread only to people you choose, yeah. and not to everyone? Yeah, that is one definition of privacy that you you, the, you have con you could the ability to have control over your data, to whom you share it, and in which context. That is one of the known definitions of privacy, and uh, this part is from Solov's book. Uh, Solov is a, a law uh, legal science uh, professor in George Washington University. I believe it, he has written many nice uh, books and about privacy. Privacy. And in his book uh, from 2008, he puts, uh, I have, uh, by the way, I have all here references later, you can see at the end, you can find where they are. Uh, he puts six uh, definitions from, these are traditional definitions, uh, the right to be let alone, limited access to oneself, secrecy, control over personal information, protection of personhood, and intimacy. These are all different types of uh, definitions that you can expect, and maybe there are more. But he addresses this, and he goes one by one, and considers the advantage, the, what is the limitations and, and of these def definitions. For example, secrecy, meaning that uh, the privacy is violated when uh, the, there is a public disclosure of private, uh, previously concealed information. If you have secret information and it is open, then it is pri the privacy is breached. And um, then uh, he analyzes. Uh, And what, what do you think the problem with this is? Any idea? If you consider the privacy as like this. Because sometimes you have, uh, you publish your data to some group, but still this is private information. If you have a user group, yeah? Um, could it be the example of Procter & Gamble, how they, uh, the example of how the data, like the analytics knew that the daughter from one person is pregnant before the father knows. Could it be? Yeah, that is one example. Yeah, right. Uh, it is. Uh, but it is, is it a secret? Boy, the, yeah, when you reveal the secret, yeah, mm -hmm. that is actually maybe this is that is that is that conforms with this definition. But the pro point is that sometimes uh, I put here uh, from that book a number of things. Um, it does this definition does not recognize group privacy, meaning that sometimes you share your data with a group, but it is still your private information. You don't expect that group share that information with others, like Facebook groups or Instagram and things. You share it with the group, not with the rest of the world. It is still private. Uh, secret information is not always private. Secret information, for example, military secrets, are not private. And sometimes private information are not secret. Like your bank account is not secret anymore. Bank knows it. Your health condition is known by the, by the, by the doctor. So this is, it is not anymore secret, but it is shared with someone. So this definition, um, uh, and sometimes, for example, you expect privacy in public. When you read the book, you are in the public. But that doesn't mean that everybody should know what are you reading. The secrecy is not the same, the same as privacy. And also here, this definition omits the elements of control, how much you have control on your data, as you mentioned. So all these definitions, uh, he sort of concludes that all these definitions, they have some, they are true in some sense, but they are not covering all parts of this privacy. They are, they, it is, uh, inclusive, it, they are either too vague or too restrictive. And then he concludes that you cannot define privacy. So you cannot say, okay, this is if you necessarily and sufficient conditions. If this is so, then that is private or not. And then uh, if you look, do that, then as if you are looking at the elephant from specific aspect, and, it's in, the, and in the dark with blind people. So, doesn't give a good picture about elephant. 
And then he uses the concept of family resemblance. You cannot define it, but the, 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 the theory of family resemblance says that if you look at this family, then you see they are related. You cannot say how you define that, because it, is it a matter of eyes or the face or thing? But the combination that you can judge that that is, um, that is uh, a family. <coughs> it also the same applies also if he believes I think also in my belief as well that it, privacy is like that you cannot define it but if you combine everybody has opinion and if you put the, 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 the collective knowledge intelligence then you can say that is private anybody disagrees with that okay. so that is the first step then the, you should not try define the privacy, he says, and what you should do there. And he says that it is better not to define it, but it is better to, it is better not to define Instead, you have to try to identify what can go wrong with privacy. And for that, he proposes a model. It's basically a data analyst, analytics model. It's very simple version of that. You have data collection, you have data processing, and then you sharing with data consumers, <laughs> and then data consumers use that data and then it you to interface with privacy sensitive information. So this is a, and every step then something can go wrong in terms of privacy. So if you say, as I said, this can be mapped to a very simple model of data analytics, information collection, information processing, information dissemination, and the feedback that you can call it invasion. So and each step can go, as I said, can things go wrong and in terms of privacy. For example, in information collect, uh, collection, he mentions two types of threats, surveillance and interrogation. Surveillance means that you put cameras overall and then try to survey, yeah, see what people do and in order to keep them in you know, a big brother kind of effect. And what happens then? You influence people's behavior. People feel that they are controlled, always watched, and they don't explore their freedom to, to be creative and, and, and so do what they want to and excel themselves. And it's a way of uh, social control. The other one is interrogation that you ask questions that are, are not supposed to be asked. These are explicit questions that inter you interrogate people. And this can also go wrong if you make a questionnaire or, I don't know, you do research about topic A and then you ask questions about very private information which are not related to your topic. That is interrogation. Then in, in information processing, he mentions a number of uh, threats, uh, aggregation, identification, insecurity, uh, secondary use, and exclusion. Aggregation means that you aggregate data from different sources in one place. Your data is, you can find in different places, and intentionally you put it in different places, actually. One part is at Focus Hall here, the other part is in Hemente Rotterdam, maybe, the other part is in... Uh, I don't know, this specific ministry, I don't know, hospital, and you name it. It is spread over. And that is good. If I try to bring them together and put a, give a nice portal, everybody can reach through that to your information, that aggregation is a violation of privacy. Identification is sometimes uh, you share your data anonymized without your identity. And if I do it other way around, try to identify that, that is a violation of privacy. If I put your data on the street, that is insecurity, that is also a violation of privacy. Secondary use, which is very important, especially in big data. The big data, maybe you should have mentioned last week, the big data is one characteristic of big data is that you have collected data for a specific purpose, for, I don't know, for uh, talking to your friends, uh, sharing your data with your buddies overall, uh, all over the world. But then I use that data for spend for marketing. I use that data for uh, seeing how healthy you are, mentally, physically, etc. And that is uh, the effect secondary use. You should be very careful, especially in the context of big data. 
La last one is exclusion, that um, the one of the conditions is that if you have data about me, I have the right to ask what you have about me. And if you don't that, you exclude me from that process, and that is not desired. Putting people in control, that is the case. Then we have the, last, the second, the third one is about uh, information dissemination. If you want to share that data that you have with others, then uh, these kind of problems can arise. Uh, for example, breach of confidentiality. That means that if you are a doctor, you have patient information, and you share it with insurance company. That is breach of confidentiality. Disclosure, you have true information about people, and, re you re it, and the, this true information is revealed by strangers beyond existing networks. And exposure is a specific case about that. If you, this is about the, 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 the data that is related to your physical and emotional attributes. <coughs> Increased accessibility. If I, as I said, if I put a, a portal where you can, everybody can get information about you or other people, then that is increased accessibility and that is also breach of privacy because by definition people try to spread their information in different places and no one wants to put them in one place. And if you do uh, accessibility, increased accessibility, that is a breach of privacy. Blackmailing, you misuse the data and, and ask people for favors and for money or for other things. Otherwise, you say, okay, I have to reveal your private information. And appropriation, that is the te uh, identity theft. Uh, that means that you steal the identity of someone and in order to make uh, some, uh, uh, for another, to use for another purpose to gain money or etc. And distortion, that means that uh, everybody has a big uh, characteristics and uh, a big uh, area of the personality and then you focus on the negative aspects and then you make it big, big uh, and then uh, that distorts uh, the person's personality in public. And then uh, we have intrusion, when you feedback data back, you, things that can go wrong in terms of uh, intrusion of pri privacy of people and decisional in interferences. Intrusion means that um, um, like you are seeing the backyard and someone goes to your backyard. In this case, you send phishing emails, I don't know, junk email, spam, telemarketing to people's emails without their consent, and that is invasion of their privacy. An intrusion. Decision inter interference, that means that I, I want to have uh, some, every, people should, should be free to make their choices and based on that free feeling. And if you indi indirectly manipulate them with this uh, private, private information, <coughs> you are intruding their privacy. And uh, anybody knows a recent example of this? Or can remember or can associate it with a recent example? Decision interference. 2016, the election of America, I mean, that, the, the, the Cambridge <laughs> Analytics, why people are very unhappy about it? Because it is a typical example of uh, yeah, yeah, decision interference. You interfere with the decision of people who think that they are doing in a well, in good way, but actually you are manipulating them through sending specific messages to them. And also marketing. I don't know, is it marketing the same or not? Uh, yeah. Maybe not, but okay, this is a philosophical question I put here and I cannot answer myself. So, what you think is that we should, as, as I said, the sort of vision is that not to define <coughs> privacy, but then try to see in the process, the data journey, journey from beginning to the end, what can go wrong. And in each step, try to, to stop it. It doesn't mean that if you do in the beginning, then it, can, it, it stops. It, it, it can, then you have to look at the whole cycle and in every stop, put enough measures to protect privacy of people. Any question on this model? No, then uh, I, I also go through this one, the impact of big data.
The big data, as I said, the online, you can get nowadays a lot of big data through, for example, uh, the way that users interact with, uh, with, with internet and uh, Google in certain searches, the sensors that we have overall, the, the, the cameras, um, I don't know, movement detectors, uh, the beacons of uh, Bluetooth that you can detect your mobile phone and things like that. And uh, your search history, uh, mm -hmm. if you look for, for example, patients like me, then Google knows that what kind of disease you have. Online transactions and shopping, <coughs> behavior, health data records, blue button is similar, then you put some, you ask question about your, uh, the blue button is a, a, sim, a symbol for patients to view online and download their own personal health records. Uh, RFID on medicines, electric uh, grids. For example, if you have uh, a very set in, the, in the beginning, we, we have this phone uh, sensor, but before there was a very naive version of that that it pushed every data that you, you consume about your uh, electricity to back to or your your uh, other utensils at home back to the back to the server in the central point, but the point is that if you push too much information back to the server, then uh, the company, the uh, utensil company, uh, like Essent or other uh, water company, they can see your behavior, for example, how often you wake up in the night, whether you, ha you have health issues or not, whether you sleep deep enough or not, that kind of things, then they can understand with this data. So what happens uh, in a big data area is that uh, the effect of big data on privacy, by the way, this is from this uh, Crawford article, it was 2014, she's from America, but uh, she writes based on the American law, but it's still there are nice aspects that we can reuse in, in the European context. Uh, so previous computational models is based on exploiting the personal identifier information. With big data, you create new, new attributes whether a person is healthy or not, it is not in the data. But if you analyze some data, like as I said, if someone wakes up at the night too many times, then you see, okay, the person maybe has, uh, I don't know, digesting problem, I don't, this kind of health issues. And also you add new details. The example that you mentioned, that if someone is pregnant, I come back again to that example later. Also one of the examples that you, you can imagine that uh, if you, the, the, the supermarket can analyze data and if see that you buy uh, diapers with other companies, then, then it can see that okay, either you have a baby or you're going to have a baby. <laughs> and that kind of data is very sensitive. You don't want to share it with Albert Einstein sometimes. Predictive, uh, predictive uh, privacy harms, collecting data using information on individual behavior without collecting them from the first or third parties. That means that you don't ask them directly, the user may use your data, and you don't get from authorized people, you produce yourself based on data analytics. And because, that, because of that, that is the second party data production, and you manufacture new personal identifier informations, information, and, uh, and then sometimes even you are not obliged legally to inform people. And this is a negative part of it because the law should be all be more clear about that. And uh, yeah, unintended impact of individuals. This is the example that you mentioned. Target in America. This is an example, typical example that uh, a teenager uh, girl was pregnant, and then um, due, based on her purchases, the, the this supermarket target understood that she's pregnant and sent a package, with well intended, a nice package to home, but the father found out, found out and then that she's pregnant and then she had a problem at home. So you don't want to, uh, yeah, to go that far uh, if you want to, yeah, to use private information. And discriminatory practices, there are many examples that landlords, for example, they don't rent their houses to specific people from a specific background. You didn't, some people didn't get financial credits, health insurances, they had some um, uh, misconduct based on this, uh, if someone was ill or too, too ill, then they did uh, differently, treat them differently. 
predictive policing means that uh, you, you send patrols, uh, police patrols to a specific area based on this big data. But if people policy goes there and then maybe find more more crimes, and then that area becomes very uh, dominant in criminal setting because you, if you search more, then you find more crimes there. And then you forget the other areas which are more the sa same behavior, but uh, you don't pay attention, and then uh, it goes on notice, and everybody assumes it is safe. And also, this kind of uh, big data analysis against clean slate law, the right to be forgotten. If you have done something wrong 10 years ago, according to the law, everybody, if you cut through your sentences and go uh, a few years, you are entitled to start a new life. But this big data analytics, it is impossible because you bring it up, okay, 10 years ago you have stolen something from that other time. And so you, okay, I was then maybe five, 15 or something. But still it can influence your, for example, if you go for a job. So big data, what happens is that uh, it is normal data, and big data you feed it again with your processing, you, you make it more, more dominant, more, more intrusive, more privacy intrusive. And then you can uh, impact people's uh, liberty, economical situation, psychological, it, it, has, it can have many different types of uh, impacts on people. So therefore you need to be very careful what kind of data you use and for what purpose. Okay, I have two minutes to finish this. Uh, and how, what you can do about this kind of technique, uh, this kind of uh, impacts of uh, big data. The article mentions that uh, uh, one due diligence uh, approach, which is based on mainly uh, American, Anglo American law, it is a little different than uh, European law, which is based on German or EU law. In German or European law, the information self determination is important that you did, yeah, you control your data. But in American Anglo American law, it is more about fair information practice. That means that the way that you use the data is important. So th that difference of focus makes that these laws are a little bit not 100% compatible. Anyway, but what she mentions uh, is from more about American perspective, which is nice maybe to know for us also. And what is that? Uh, what you can do? There are typical uh, solutions for dealing with privacy. But for this kind of privacy with big data, uh, predictive privacy harms. Uh, in, uh, and it says that the procedural due process. This is a legal term, meaning that uh, it is coming from, for example, American Constitution that. For example, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. <coughs> what does it mean in our setting is that the process of law is that if you decide that, okay, I don't want to share you, give you this loan to you, or I want to increase your, your uh, insurance level but that much, then I have to give the person enough time and also uh, room to, to prote protest against this decision by going to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the judge and to the courts and things like that. I cannot immediately apply it. And the other, so it, it has also other non-technical technical aspects. For technical aspects also, if you design a system, it should be transparent and self-explainable and, 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 and so if you look at it, everybody can look at it and everybody can understand it especially judges and lawyers, uh, in order to see whether you have done well, a good job or not. You cannot uh, make a big uh, data analytics uh, algorithm that no one understands, but gives a good results. That is not good enough nowadays. That is the technological part. For non-technological, the, the procedural due process but taken that means that if you come with conclusion, I have to do something about that specific user, then I have to give him or her enough time and room to protest against this decision. Not to immediately apply it. Okay, these are uh, still in ongoing research areas, but still you have to keep into account that if you do something which affects people's yeah, freedom, liberty, uh, economical, and that affects their money pockets, then you have to give them enough time to protest. 
So the point is that you should not, you should prevent <coughs> from someone from being dismissed. Okay, then maybe it is good time to have a break, yeah? Uh, no. Maybe it's nice, for example, we start with a little bit to stay a little bit uh, focused on the fact of privacy and how you feel about privacy. And one of the arguments that all, everybody says nowadays is that I have nothing to hide. So I don't care about privacy. Mm -hmm. Who is like that in this public? I mean, who, think, who thinks like that? Or other way around? Do you have something to hide? Huh? Can I ask? So for that, I guess, I, again, I go back to Solov. Uh, and I think this is a nice uh, video. I advise you later, you can uh, Google it, and I could just give, put five minutes, the first five, five minutes of that year, uh, because he was also uh, someone who wrote a paper about I have nothing to hide from you. And I started here. Hello. No internet. <laughs> So if you have Wi-Fi working, please. Many people say they're not concerned at all about the fact that the government is gathering personal information and analyzing it. After all, the argument goes, if you've got nothing to hide, why worry about it? Well, not so fast, says our next guest. And joining us now for more on his concerns, in Washington, D.C., Daniel Solov. He is professor of law at George Washington University. And Professor Solov, it's good of you to join us on the line in D.C. How are you tonight? Very good. Thanks so much for having me. Not at all. I suspect this is self-evident just by asking the question, but let's get it on the record anyway. In its most basic form, the I've got nothing to hide argument is what? The nothing to hide argument is when people say, hey, I'm not really concerned about government surveillance or government listening in on my phone calls or collecting my data because I've got nothing to hide. I'm not doing anything wrong. Everything I'm doing is innocent. And uh, unless you have something illegal that you're doing, then you shouldn't be concerned about government surveillance because they're only out to get the bad guys. In the course of you doing your responsibilities, how often do you hear that? All the time. It's everywhere. If you search the internet for nothing to hide, you'll see uh, tons of instances where this argument is being made. Um, I see it on the media, I see people interviewed every day, you actually see it in uh, various academic uh, arguments and political arguments, um, often um, uh, couched directly as nothing to hide, sometimes it's uh, uh, with slightly different terms, but the basic argument is, is the same. Did the prevalence of hearing that argument have an effect on you that resulted in this book? Yes, well, I've, I'd heard it for, for quite a long time, and uh, the issue then uh, became, you know, is there a good response, a response to this argument? What's wrong with it? Um, and since it's so prevalent and so many people believe it and argue it, how can we respond to it? Uh, and that's what sparked my writing on this topic, was to really pick apart this argument and explain concretely and articulately what is wrong with this argument and why protection of privacy against surveillance matters? Well, as we explore what your argument is, I should just preface that by saying we had a University of Ottawa professor named Michael Geist on the program recently, and he said, you got nothing to hide? Great, drop your pants. It was uh, not perhaps the greatest academic argument for explaining why he was against that nothing to hide uh, position, uh, but perhaps you can help us in a somewhat more scholarly way answer the question of what your main issue is with nothing to hide as an argument. Sure. Well, I think uh, uh, Professor Geist's uh, argument was one common response to the argument is basically, hey, I'm going to point to something that you want to hide and <coughs> there, see there are some things that you want to hide. But folks um, making the nothing to hide argument in a more sophisticated way will say, well, that might not be the subject of government surveillance. They're not going to get your naked picture. Um, what people are really talking about is, I have nothing to hide when I'm talking on the phone, or I have nothing to hide in my metadata. And metadata is 
you know, the phone numbers that you're dialing or the numbers that are dialing into you or, you know, who you're emailing and so on and so forth. Uh, and so people will say in that grouping of data, um, there's nothing to hide. But there's a response to that, a response that you don't need to just point to things that people actually want to hide. Uh, and that is the nothing to hide argument sees privacy in too narrow a way. It sees privacy as protecting discreditable secrets about people. But there's a lot more to privacy than just protecting against secrets. Privacy is about power. It's about how much power the government should have to explore uh, the deepest parts of our lives. How much information should the government have? What should the government be able to do with that information? Uh, there's a lot of instances where even if you're doing nothing wrong, uh, you might not want government surveillance of your activities. I should hasten to add that I think Michael Geist was being facetious. In fact, I know he was being facetious when he said that. And he also said, you know, if you've got nothing to hide, you're not leading a very interesting life. But the issue around this assumption of privacy, have we just lost that in this society today? I don't think so. Uh, one of the things that's actually been encouraging is some of the uh, public opinion. Okay. I hope that this gives you some idea of why that is wrong, and also maybe later you come back to this uh, and you can find it through internet uh, why uh, it is important to pay attention to your privacy. Okay, uh, just following the, the rest of the presentation that I had in mind, um, any question on that or objection? <coughs> Okay, I go now a little bit uh, the technical side of it, how you protect data, and it, because uh, the technical aspects gives you what can go wrong. You can feel more bad, easier what, yeah, why, uh, and how people can misuse the data that is shared, and then uh, what are the techniques to, to stop that uh, misuse. But it, again, uh, I will try to finish it in 25 minutes um, from now so that you can have five minutes for questions, I guess, uh, or more. Uh, but let's see how far we can go. Introduction to data publishing. Data publishing, you know, we see the, the whole cycle from and going from data subjects to data publisher, the first that you publish your data to, for example, this is Facebook. You, everybody shares data with Facebook, and Facebook sends it back to the data receiver, which is, for example, an advers advertisement company. So the first part is called data collection, the other part is data pub publication, and we now focus on data publication. You know, you, the first part, the, the, uh, the threat model, the first part is mostly you, you can trust because it is your own environment, your own mobile device. But the, th the second part, which is data publisher, Facebook, for example, you can tr may trust, you may not trust in terms of privacy. Uh, and the third part, which goes to data receiver, is totally untrusted. You don't know how people are going to use your data. So this is a thread model. Um, you have, okay, I skipped this slide. There are different uh, data publishing uh, scenarios. One of them is like this. Yeah, everybody shares data, for example, with different, uh, everybody shares data with different uh, data publishers. For example, there's Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, you name it. And then uh, data receiver receives data from these uh, publisher. This is very classic way of this, looking at the problem that you see that uh, it is not only a matter of the data that goes around like this, but the other data that are background information are important for data receiver to detect privacy sensitive information about you. Uh, ideally, they should collaborate. Ideally, these people should, co uh, these uh, data publishers should collaborate to protect your data, but they are not. They are from different organizations, and each of them they publish data independently. and. And uh, if that is the case, then you are in trouble. You are in trouble because data receiver has two parts: the data that you share with it, and also background information. And that is the difficult part. Background information: it is difficult to see what the background information is, especially that everybody now publishes a lot of data about the, their uh, social life, etc., in other media. So this is the model that you can imagine, and this data goes directly to data receiver. But both of them they have background information. And I, with example now, try to make it clear what can go wrong with a very simple example. 
data publishing that stage uh, can have uh, can have relation can have two aspect two parts like non interactive and interactive you publish data like you have a bunch of data you share it with someone that is uh, non interactive the other part is interactive meaning that you are sitting here and everybody asks queries a question what is the average income here? Then I give reply. What is the average income here without Alphonse? Then I give another. Then you can subtract and then see how much Alphonse has income. So this is interactive uh, way of uh, dealing with data. The first part is about non-interactive that I give you the income of everybody in this room and then if you can see how much Alphonse earns or how much I earn or how much you earn. Anyway, so uh, in this course, uh, I mean, talk will focus mainly on this type of data, micro data. Micro data is like this, is a table. Every row is one person. Like this is the hospital table, for example, data. And this is the patient, the box, and they put some uh, uh, demographic information like job, gender, and age, and what kind of disease he has, and for example, something about his uh, heart. The point is that if, you sh if I share this data before you knew a little about Pope, after you know more about Bob, that difference, if it is too much, then I have revealed Bob's info private information. That is the technical way of defining privacy. The first way. I mean, there is another way, but this is the main, main way. Example is like this. If I tell you there is some criminal in the world, what is the chance that you are that person? Is in one in seven billion. If I tell you that the person is in, in Europe, then the chance goes down to one in 700,000. If I tell you that the person is in, uh, in the Netherlands, then that chance goes to one in 17 million. If I, that you are that person, or you are that person, or you might that person. If I tell you that he's in Rotterdam, that person, it is 600,000 people. If I tell you that the person is in this household, then it becomes 35,000 people. One in 35,000 that you are that, that person. So if I say that this class it is 60 people, and uh, if I say that someone in the first row, then we have six people that uh, you are that person. If I tell you that you are that person, then it is really everybody knows that, that you. And you see, the if they, they, it depends, for example, in the first action, if the previous that the, the before revealing data it was like this, and then after it becomes someone in this class, you reveal the same some information about privacy information of you. If I tell if, if it was like someone in Europe, and then it becomes exactly you, then that becomes uh, really revealing the private information about you. Legally, the second one is the privacy breach. But technically, both are similar because they reduce from high probability to low probability. And, and depending on the context, each of them can be privacy breach. Having this in mind, we look at, uh, uh, we look at uh, data protection, how you protect this data if you want to share that table. If you look at, for example, GDPR, they mention two types of, or many types of data protection. I put it here, some of them, technically. One is that to have encryption and access control. I put them together. Encrypt and do access control, for example. The other one is personalization and data minimization. And the other groups you can put, for example, inform data subjects, demonstrate compliance, give control to data subjects. Uh, maybe you can find other technical solutions also in, in GDPR. My question is to you, what is the difference between group one and group two? That you, the group one, you encrypt and uh, give access control, and in group two, you do data minimization. Any, any, new, any idea? In group one, you keep the data, but you uh, encrypt uh, the private information. In group two, you get rid of the private information. That is, a, yeah, that one way I'm putting it. Yeah. The, the more I had intended, but for in the group one, you try to keep outsiders outside. You, you have to keep data to your the insiders. In the second one, you protect data from insiders as well. You meet, if I share data with you, if I give you too much information, maybe I trust you, but still that is not allowed. 
because it's too much information that, for that purpose. So the point that GDPR is very, very nicely nowadays pushes everybody to do is you have some specific objective in mind. I want to use this data for marketing. I want this data to use for healthcare. So if that is the case, you have to minimize data for that purpose, not more. So you have to find this balance. I cannot produce a lot of detailed information and for example, that example of sensor uh, for, for energy, energy usage at home, I cannot pump every bit of information, every millisecond back to SN. SN wants that data for what? For accounting? Okay, I can, I can push it every month or every two months, every three months, the whole consumption, and then that's enough for that purpose, not more. So keep the data as minimal as possible for that purpose. Okay. Any question? If there is no question, then I go a little bit techniques that you can apply to minimize data when you want to share data with others. That table. So this is a table your hospital you share with someone, like for uh, for, for healthcare research. And uh, for healthcare research, you want to share this data with others. Okay. What you do, you define the attributes in, in four categories. Explicit identifiers like names. Quasi identifiers, I come to that later. Sensitive attributes, for example, the, the illness is sensitive. And non sensitive attributes. So if you look at this table, you see that the names are explicit identifier. You can, these are like names, social security numbers, and etc. If you look at that, the, those things, you can identify the people, <coughs> the people behind. Okay, I put here Bob, but actually it should be the whole family name. And also, some names are not so specific. For example, in, in Netherlands, you have uh, Williamson, many, many Williamsons. But if it is like Mortaza Schwaipak, my name, then it is very specific. So you, but generally, this is a express identifies. If you look at them, you can identify people. Then we have diseases. These are sensitive attributes because it is only available to you as a hospital, and no one else knows that. And the, the purpose of sharing this table is to, to give some um, researchers time to do research about these uh, attributes and find the relation with other uh, demographic <laughs> information. Height is non-sensitive. I don't care my, about my height or your height. And it is mostly not sensitive. So assume that in this case it is non-sensitive. Although sometimes can be very sensitive if, if something is someone is very um, unhappy or uh, there is some problem with the height. If, 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 if it, it, it is uh, very but uh, my question to you now is that what can go wrong if you these quasi identifiers? What are the, what is the why this called quasi identifiers? Combine them, you might uh, get to know who it is. So. You combine with what? With uh, yeah, you combine them and yeah, almost close. <laughs> um, maybe we will generalize some average. We'll just maybe some average. Uh -huh. For example, age, average height, and height. Mm. Yeah, you do often you have to apply these techniques. But before, if you share this data, sometimes if these are in your table. But outside world, you can combine with the other data sets where there are also names next to this, and then you can identify people. Example is like this. Okay, I come to this uh, question identifiers, but uh, first of all, uh, this process that I'm going now to describe is called the technically analyzation, that you hide the identity of people and sensitive information about them. What you can do is that you, for explicit identifiers, you do removing suppression and customization. Okay, this is uh, okay. This is uh, removing. You remove the name attribute totally. If you remove, then uh, that is the first approach. 
Sometimes you need to put this in place because you want to know to show that you have changed something. And you put the name attribute there, but you replace them, suppress them with three stars or something else. That is suppression. And sometimes you do personalization. You change the, num the name to number, very random number. If you look at the number, no one can see that is Bob. And that is called personalization. And uh, anybody can know can say why personalization is is, is sometimes <coughs> necessary. Why you change the name to some random number in this table? Because sometimes you want to link this table with another table and Bob here and Bob there, so same person. And then you give them both same numbers to, in order to be able to link them. So sometimes the personalization is needed. Okay, we, as soon as we have done that part, what, what we have to not be, well, quasi identifiers. Quasi identifiers are dangerous also because if you look at them, they seem a little bit innocent, but they can go wrong if this happens. Quasi identifiers can be found also in external data set. If you link them, you can come up with explicit identifiers. Example is this. End of the year 90s, a lady Sweeney from MIT. She took two data sets, one published by a hospital, which removed the names. And these are the diseases and the patient's date of birth, sex, and zip code. And then they share it with the, with the public. Sweeney took this data set and found another data set available in the Boston area about voter list. In America, if you vote, then there is another list that you can put your name with address, everything, and date of birth, and sex, and zip code. So using these three attributes and name, she was able to link some patients with the name of patients to the diseases. For example, she was able to link uh, the governor of Massachusetts to that data set saying that what kind of illness he had at the time. So the point is that they are using these uh, quasi identifiers and external data set with name and quasi identifiers. You can identify some entries or all of the entries. And this is called background information. The blue one is the data that you share. The rest, the, the red ones, are background information. Imagine that now happens that if you publish a lot of personal data on innocent personal data on Facebook, Instagram, etc., you increase this, this <coughs> set. Your name is there. Your like dislikes are all there, and that can be used to link to, to the, the anonymized data to re-identify anonymized data. So what are the techniques that you can apply here for uh, quasi identifiers? In literature, you can find many of them. Uh, you can, uh, OK. For quasi identifiers, like next slide I will give. For sensitive attributes, you, some, you, don't, you try not to change sensitive attributes. You don't, you don't try to uh, manipulate too much, because the purpose of sharing is to share this information with others to make use of it. Non-sensitive attributes are not nonsense. Are non-sensitive, so you don't care. You don't change uh, we are, because they are not privacy sensitive. And then, question identifies what you do. Simple. There are some non, uh, simple of way doing that you mentioned also. I put here a list of them that you cannot do. For example, you can remove them, uh, and you can. But sometimes removal is not the answer because you want to share some part of it. You generalize them, for example, if exact age, you change the range of the age. Suppress them, like age 34, because if it is too sensitive, if someone is 99 years old, it is, becomes very sensitive, then, then you put stars in, in a set. Anatomization is a technique that needs a lot of uh, explanation, so I skip that. Uh, the other one is a permutation that you change the ages of two data records. In one category, you may change the ages of two people. In category, for example, the people above 50 plus people, maybe you change the ages of some people to make the, the data a little bit uh, difficult to reconstruct, re-identify. 
and perturbate. Perturbate, <laughs> perturbation meaning that you add some noise to data. You add some noise to data to protect. Uh, for example, the age, if it is 34, you add sometimes plus one, minus one, plus two, minus two, randomly. Okay. The point that now, now maybe I describe this section, then uh, I go and I skip the other part. Privacy attacks. If you apply these techniques, it still things can go wrong. There are four technical uh, yeah, attacks that I mentioned in literature. Record linkage, attribute linkage, table linkage, and probabilistic link attack. I, go, I describe them one by one. We have 10 minutes, or I don't know how yes. much. Yes, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Yes. Okay. Um, then, uh, for example, uh, patient table, if you release this table from people who, who were hospitalized last week in Rotterdam from uh, um, uh, Erasmus UMC. And uh, then you know that these people are all, yeah, you know that your boss is here because he was hospitalized. And then you want to see what kind of diseases he or she had. Then you go to the Gemeente, because Gemeente, they have a similar, similar table with name, gen, job, gender, and age. And then you see okay, whether I can find the re-identified people in this table or not. If you look at these three attributes, they are exactly the same and unique. This patient appears one time in the Gemeente Rotterdam data, and the other one the same, other one the same. So in a way, you can re-identify all, all rows of this table. So if you're, then you can see, okay, your boss is Bob or Alice, and what kind, what kind of diseases they have. So this is called the record linkage. That means that you re-identify every record. Okay, one, then we go one step further. It's called attribute. Sometimes it is difficult to identify the exact uh, record per person. For example, in this example, I changed the age 31, 31 here. Same story, you back at the commentary that are done, you see two people having the same. So you cannot say Emily is which row or Gladys is which row. But still you can identify some private information about these people. And what is that? Yeah, HIV. Both of them, they have HIVs. So in this way, you, uh, you understand what kind of disease either of them have. That is called attributory linkage. The third one is called table linkage. Sometimes, okay, last examples, we said, okay, you know that your boss was hospitalized and you know that he should be in that table. But sometimes you don't know it. And then you ask, okay, is my boss there or not? So you get this table a little bit anonymized, and the question is that, okay, my boss is here or not? But you know that this is from people in Rotterdam. You go to the Gemeente, and then you get this table, and you see that uh, you have generalization of professional male and between age 35 and 39. And here, in Gemeente, we have three persons with that characteristics. So we see that Bob, there are three people in Rotterdam, and there are three patients here. Because there are three, three, that means that Bob for sure should be in this table, right? The chance that Bob is there, 100%. And uh, because there are four people with these characteristics in Rotterdam, so for sure, Alice also should be in this table. So you can know that the Bob, you cannot say which row Bob is, but you can know that Bob for sure is there. Same, you cannot so, uh, see which row Alice is, but you can know that for sure she is here. And sometimes this is also revealing, because imagine this is a table of people who are ill, and you are an insurance company. Then you can know that Alice, with high probability, has HIV. If you are, for example, uh, you're looking for a job, and this is the people who are impri imprisoned, then you can know that, okay, Alice should be imprisoned. And then you say, okay, I don't want to hire you. And etc. So sometimes being associated with the table is also dangerous. Privacy is intrusive. 
last one is a little bit diff. Uh, this is called uh, progressive linkage. I changed here to Rose, lawyer and dancer. The problem is a bit changed because there are three people, professional male and 35, 39, and there are here four people like that. Here you have three people, and here you have four people. And here you have four people, artist, female, 30, 34, and here we have five such people here. So here you cannot be sure that Bob is here, but you can have very really good idea that with 75% he's there. And Alice is with 80% is here. And for example, Alice 80% is here, and 75% she has HIV. So if you are insurance company, you can say, okay, most likely she has HIV. So things can go wrong. <laughs> One of the nice examples about progressive attacks, which this is very, the other ones are very difficult to do, do but, but this one is more, more, more likely, so I'll give you more example. In literature, you can have uh, American Online example, genome-wide association study, and also Netflix, uh, uh, literature on these uh, attacks. And I describe this one, Netflix one. Netflix in 2006 published 500,000 records about people who liked their movies or not, and they removed uh, the names and uh, other identifying information, and then asked other people to come with recommendation system that if you see movie one, or movie two, three, four, then you can recommend other movies. Two researchers used uh, this uh, very seriously because this is the published data by Netflix, so you see that they removed the name and, the, and also the demographic information and the movie one like, dislike, like, dislike, etc. So this is person one. But in the internet, Netflix, I don't know, at the time it was an IMDB database, an internet movie database. People also voluntarily put their names with some movies that they like, very highly sophisticated movies. I like this movie, I don't like this movie, etc. So if you look at these things, and if there are enough movies here, like dislikes, like 10 in the order of 10, then everybody here becomes unique. So if you know the name here, then you can link it uniquely with this one, and you see that these other movies that you are so like or dislike. And these are, these are private information because you don't want to share it. If you wanted to share, you could have put it here. These are dangerous movies, for example, or I don't know, uh, you can imagine that no one wants to share this with public. So this is a very typical uh, example that the probabilistic is. You cannot be sure that which row Alice is the first row, but with high probability you can know that she's the first row. And if you know that, you can increase her insurance, for example. And this is also what happened more or less in this Cambridge analytics. They use some uh, very innocent question to come with your profile and send you with your what kind of background, uh, political background you have, and then send you a target advertisement to choose for this uh, candidate or other. Okay, there are privacy, privacy models that I, I, I skip it here. Uh, so you can look at it uh, and... Uh, so there are these privacy models that improve on the previous techniques. And the, the role of the background information, as I said, we model background information like this in these three attributes. So if I, share this, if I tell you this is a table of patient, patients from the whole Netherlands, then maybe this is true to say this is background information. But if I tell you this is from people from this room, is this a good background information or not? The modeling background. If I tell you that this table comes from people from this, these people, can you reveal the identity of someone from this table? Length. Yeah. Yeah. Two ten. That becomes also revealing. If there is someone one person that length, then that becomes also revealing for that person. So in applying these techniques, you have to have a good estimate of the background information. To whom you share data and you have background information. Okay, then I skip this part. 
this part, the tools that you can use in practice for applying these techniques, this is one of the nice ones is ARCs. If you want, you can go for them. And we have written a big document, uh, like 120, 120 pages or something, about these techniques. And if you want, you can go and uh, study from there. And uh, I have uh, some uh, relation with big data, but very short. But I don't know if we have, we have time, two minutes or something. Everybody has to go? No? No, maybe this is a knife. Because these techniques are seem simple, but it is meant for a specific type of data, <coughs> like patient data. But if you go for your exam, your, uh, your assignment with the, uh, the airport of uh, uh, Rotterdam, uh, Den Haag, and uh, then come up with, uh, OK, the tra tracing and tracking people, keep in mind. For example, if you have application that tracks everybody's uh, from home to office, and you say that uh, the person lives at uh, time one, uh, this is home, road, office. Person two, your application says that he is home, road, road, office. Person three, home, road, 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 office. And person four, uh, home, road, 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 office. And person uh, five or six is home. Um, Second row. Yeah, road, road, and it, it shifted. So if you see, everybody has distinct signature based on movement. The point that I'm trying to make is that you can, uh, it is, it, everybody becomes unique here. And you can re-identify the person. If you look at the patterns of people. You, if you add more information about where is the home and where is the destination, you can know for sure that who that person is. So in this kind of settings, what you do is that um, you have two problems. Identity privacy, because every row becomes a specific person. You can re-identify people based on only that pattern. And behavior privacy. Sometimes, based on that, you can know that whether someone wakes up early in the morning, <coughs> or too, too, too early, or too late, or what kind of problems he or she has. So you can understand. Um, personal habits, addictions, health problems, uh, occupancy, travel routes, etc. So how do you do that? You have to minimize data as much as possible from the source. You cannot push data back to the, the central point. Sources that on your mobile app, you have, to, you have to try to minimize data as much as possible. So keeping in mind, if you want to go for that scenario to see if you, yeah, how much data you need to share it with the central point and the rest you have to hide. Takeaways, conclusions, not trying to define privacy, adopting a problem-oriented approach, what can, what can go wrong, and then try to address those problems. You have to do it from design stage. And uh, it is a basically multidisciplinary approach. You cannot see, apply this on, on business, only business people or only technical people. Or you need uh, all people, politicians, etc., to be involved uh, in that uh, design process. And uh, we talked about uh, microdata, how you can protect an uh, uninformative principle. I hope that you got my idea about that. Uh, there are many methods to apply, and the point is that you cannot find one bullet, silver bullet. You have to apply different techniques next to each other to have enough to reduce the, the privacy breach risk as much as possible. So this was uh, more or less what I wanted to share today. I don't know if there is time for discussion. Yes, we have time for some questions. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Take time. <laughs> Yeah. I have a question. Um, <coughs> what is the negotiation process between data publisher company X and data rec uh, data receiver company X and data publisher, for example, social media? How they negotiate between each other? Uh, yeah. Can you repeat the question, Martasha? Because we, we didn't fully. Yeah. Oh. The question is how uh, the, the negotiation uh, negotiation protocol between data publisher and data consumer. Uh, um, it depends. It depends with what context you have. Sometimes you, you are publishing between two organizations, which you have enough control. Then you negotiate. Okay, I share this data with you for that purpose and not more than that. 
Uh, yeah, and then uh, that co company is obliged, and then you go with DPR, the data, prote data, pro data protection impact assessment kind of process to, to make everything fixed that I am going to use this data for that purpose and not more. But sometimes you publish it with the public, yeah, put it on a web, web page or something, yeah? Then, uh, then there is no one that can talk to it. There is no one, you, you publish it to the public, you make it open. And that means that you have to put yourself enough enough measures to protect data as much as possible. So you can you could not if there is a small chance that something you know that something can go wrong, then you are responsible. But then there is no hundred percent guarantee. Nowadays we believe that the, the point is the, uh, the GDPR makes is like this. You have to show that you have done your best to protect this data. So if you put it on your web page, you have to show that I have gone through all processes, I have minimized it, I have generalized it, etc. And then if in the 10 years later something goes wrong, then you have enough evidence that you have done well at that time. Okay, I think the evidence that you've done well is very important for controllers in companies because they have to well, prove they have, they have taken care of the data and have taken care of privacy. So very important topic, I guess, for all of you uh, controllers or going to be controllers. Any other questions from you? No? Okay. One, one last remark, yes. just uh, the finishing touch. Uh, only here I talked about data publishing, but how you process data, you have some measures. And if it, all these cycles that I mentioned, you have to have measures. You have to have put them after each other. That combination brings the, 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 the risk to the minimum as possible. So that was uh, yeah, the, the, the general. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And, uh,